before we get into the word, we'll just have a word of prayer. God in heaven, thank you for this Sabbath, thank you for this day, and as we open your word now, we ask that your Holy Spirit would guide us and direct us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So this coming Sunday is a unofficial holiday for Americans, and unless you've been living under a rock, um, especially in this part of the country, it's been everywhere. I saw a billboard as I was driving down of a countdown until the big game, talking about the Super Bowl between the Kansas City Chiefs and the Philadelphia Eagles. How many of you are aware of the lead up to the game about Media Day? If you've never heard of Super Bowl Media Day, it's basically, uh, according to SB Nation, it's where players and coaches are herded into the stadium and they're forced to sit at tiny elevated podiums or walk around the floor while getting peppered with questions from all angles, often from outlets, and some credible, some not so credible. So how many of you would be open to the idea of being herded into a stadium I know some of you served at, at Lucas Oil Stadium, uh, I think about a year ago, to help with the health clinic. So imagine being herded in there and having a bunch of reporters coming around you and asking you questions, some related to the game and some of them personal. In fact, this past couple of day, uh, some of the questions, two of the main questions that were asked, one of them was asking the Philadelphia Eagles coach, do you think this game is a must-win game? <laughs> Super Bowl must win game and he actually replied nonchalantly yeah <laughs> another question that was asked was to the Eagles starting quarterback it wasn't really a question because the reporter said I'll be honest with you I didn't think that you were going to be able to lead the team to the Super Bowl and the quarterback Jalen Hurts said many people didn't and then the reporter said I'm sorry about that by the way and Jalen Hurts, not knowing who this guy was, as if somehow that it got to his ears that this guy didn't think he just went, cool? <laughs> but Super Bowl Media Day offers a chance for these players on the eve of their biggest event to answer questions, hopefully good questions, though, as I've just said, some of these questions are a bit questionable. Well, today, I want to look at a special interview that took place between the greatest, I think, uh, sacrifice of all time, that would be Jesus Christ, between him and a religious leader of his day, who would have been, I guess you could say, the one with press credentials of the highest order in that society. So if you have your Bibles, I invite you to open to the book of John. And we're going to be in the book of John chapter 3. Now as you're getting there, just a little bit of a lead up. This is early in Jesus' ministry, about A.D. 28. And he's in Jerusalem, and he's just recently cleansed the temple. And so this was where he made the whip of cords, and he drove out the money changers who were uh, engaging in practices that were basically cheating regular people. Well, Jesus also, during that time, basically tells the Jewish people who say to him, you know, who gives you the authority to do these things? You know, what sign do you show to us? And Jesus answers them with the famous quote, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. Now, how many of you knew that happened at the beginning of Jesus' ministry? I mean, that's, that's pretty early. He would minister for a couple more years before making his way back there for his passion. But early on, he's making this statement about himself. Well, Jesus' event definitely drew the eyes of people that were there. Not just the regular person, but also the religious leaders like scribes and Pharisees. Well, one of them, and the man that we're going to be focusing on, is a man named Nicodemus. So in John chapter 3, verse 1, it says there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. Nicodemus himself was a very highly esteemed ruler, and he was a uh, religious scholar, you could say, being a Pharisee, very focused on the law. Now, it says in verse 2 that he came to Jesus by night. 
So while the Super Bowl media day is out in the open during the day, Nicodemus chooses to come at night to visit Jesus. And the question is, why would he come during the nighttime? Most likely, it was because he did not want it known publicly that he was actually meeting with Jesus. You say, why, why would he not want it to be public? Because Jesus was a controversial figure. Starting out his ministry, he's doing these signs, he's healing, he drove people out of the temple. There's a question among the religious leaders, is this guy a prophet from God, someone that we should be paying attention to, or is he a rabble-rouser? Nicodemus, understanding that, but being intrigued by Christ's actions and words, is meeting with him, hoping to have a discussion, hoping to have a one-on-one -on -one interview to kind of pick at Jesus' brain. And so he comes to Jesus by night and says, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. So Nicodemus is more on the side that, you know, maybe we need to pay attention to this Jesus character. And if you know anything about the Jewish people, their history was littered with prophets from God coming to them, trying to tell them the right way, and the people rejecting it, and then they received punishments from God. And so these religious leaders would have known that history, and the cautionary tale is, you know, are we about to repeat the same mistake that our forefathers did? Just because this Jesus guy is, is causing some, some conflict here, it doesn't necessarily mean that he's a bad guy, because the prophets themselves were causing some uproar, but they were doing it for the sake of the truth. So maybe we should reserve some judgment about this Jesus before we decide to label him as a problem. Again, this is the beginning of Jesus' ministry. And Nicodemus has taken it upon himself because he's more in the camp of, let's, let's pump the brakes a little bit here before we make a judgment. And I'm going to go myself to basically talk with this Jesus and find out what he has to say. Now Jesus, knowing all things, by the way, unlike someone who would be interviewed at NFL Super Bowl Media Day, not knowing what question is going to come in, Jesus already knows what's in Nicodemus' heart. In fact, Nicodemus has come to basically have a discussion, and Jesus already knows what the core issue is. And Jesus catches, I think, Nicodemus off guard. Because it says, Jesus answers and said to him, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Whoa! That is a... That's cutting straight to the issue here. That has nothing to do with, with uh, what Nicodemus says. Nicodemus is trying to introduce himself like, hey, Rabbi, you know, I've seen that you've done these great things. We think you might be sent from God. Kind of an introduction building up to a, a discussion. If you've ever watched debates or interviews, usually the beginnings, there's these formalities where it says so-and-so is a professor or a doctor or they, and they've done these great things. And, you know, this is their credentials, and then they're going to slowly transition into it. Jesus, in this one-on-one -on -one meeting, cuts straight through the formalities because he knows exactly why Nicodemus is here. And he hits them with an interesting statement that says, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, for Nicodemus... This is a puzzling thing. And he says to him in verse 4, How can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? He's asking this kind of ironically, by the way. He understands, obviously, that you can't be born physically twice. But for Nicodemus, he is a Jewish person. And so in his mind, he doesn't have to go through a conversion experience. And when we say born again, this would have been language that would have been familiar to him because someone who wanted to join into the Jewish society to worship God, called a proselyte, usually someone who was not Jewish, a Gentile, would undergo this process where they would uh, eventually be baptized, they'd come to accept the teachings, and this baptism would have been full immersion. And the view was this was kind of like being born again that you're rejecting your old identity and you're now a new creature, a new uh, being who has accepted an identity in the worship of God. 
hence the sense born again. Well, Nicodemus doesn't think that this applies to him, so for him, he's a little bit confused. You know, I know that I don't need to do that. So, what exactly are you talking about? Are you talking about a physical rebirth? I mean, it doesn't really make sense. Well, here goes Jesus again. He says, verse 5, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Uh, the Greek there, by the way, can be translated water and spirit, or it can be translated water that is the Spirit. And this is language calling back to Ezekiel. And that in the book of Ezekiel, there is actually language to symbolically describe the work of the Holy Spirit as water. In fact, it's in Ezekiel 36, verse 24, starts, For I will take you from among the nations, gather you out of all the countries, and bring you into your own land. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them. Mm -hmm. Now, this is actually a really good way to describe that we understand the work of the Holy Spirit when it comes to baptism. We don't believe that one has to be baptized with water in order to be saved. Rather, it's the baptism of the Holy Spirit. When one accepts God into their heart, it causes a new person to be born. And that when we have baptism with the water, it's a public display of that new creature. It's a public symbol. The same way John, when he was baptizing, it wasn't necessarily the water that was saving him. It was the new heart of their choice to accept Christ, accept God into their hearts to create this new creature and exemplified symbolically with the water. So I think that while it says water and spirit, I personally like water that is the spirit, again, calling back to that symbolic connection between water and the work of the Holy Spirit. And it says, that which is born of the flesh, this is verse 6, is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. This is highly offensive to Nicodemus. This is highly offensive. Because Jesus is saying, you are not saved by virtue of your birth alone as an Israelite, by your keeping of your good works of the law. The Pharisees were real sticklers for the law, for tradition, in order to make sure that the people of God would not fall back into sin, Jesus is cutting at the issue and saying, that does not save you. What you're saved by is the working of God in your heart. A real conversion. And just like the wind that blows where it wishes, you don't know how the Spirit of God works within us. But it does. The same way that when wind blows and it hits your face, you can feel it's working, but you can't physically see it. Nicodemus' response in verse 9, How can these things be? And when I think he's saying this, it's a part of him that's being cut to his core, but at the same time, there's a part of him that's like, How can this be? You're challenging all of my preconceptions about what it means to be saved, salvation, and even a keeper of the law. And Jesus says to him, are you a teacher of Israel and do not know these things? Most assuredly, I say to you, we speak what we know and testify what we have seen, and you do not receive our witness. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended to heaven, but he who has come down from heaven, that is, the Son of Man who is in heaven. Nicodemus, I could tell you heavenly truths, but you wouldn't be able to necessarily comprehend them. I'm trying to describe to you in earthly language the best way I can of the working of God in a person's life. 
the working of the Holy Spirit, the working of what it means to be born again, a new creature in Christ. And I have to use earthly language for you. You see, I have come down from heaven with truth that is beyond our own understanding, but I have contextualized it for you. So if you're not going to believe me when I tell you it in this earthly language, how much more would it be ununderstandable to you if I told you in heavenly language? It wouldn't. It's something that you are going to have to trust me on the way that I'm telling it to you, the way God works in a person's heart, what it truly means to have a relationship with him, to be saved, to receive salvation. It's a work of the Spirit in your life, not an outward action that you can say, look at my good works, look at my resume, and this is why God should accept me. And then he hits him with a big... I think, big preview that would only make sense to Nicodemus much later on. In verse 14 it says, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. This is a call back to the book of Numbers, where the people of Israel were being bitten by these serpents that were causing them to die. And they asked Moses, what are we going to do? And by the way, they were being bitten by these serpents because they were sinning against God. And so these serpents in the wilderness were attacking them. They were not under God's protection. And God tells Moses, make a bronze serpent and lift it up. And those that will look on it will be saved. They weren't saved because they saw a serpent. It's not as if the bronze that was being made was, had some saving element. Rather, to look upon that was an act of faith in the healing power of God. And so in the same language, Jesus is calling back to that serpent being lifted up, the looking upon it, to see that there is a saving power by faith that God is doing, that one is not saved because of their actions, but because of faith. This would not make sense to Nicodemus fully until the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, when he would look and see Christ being lifted up, would definitely be a callback to that meeting that he had here early in Jesus' ministry about the Son of Man being lifted up. And then finally, we get the most well-known scripture, I'd say. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Mm -hmm. If you still didn't understand it, Nicodemus, this is my mission. I am here for salvation. I am here <coughs> to give justification for the remission of sin. I am here that those who believe in me will inherit the everlasting life that Adam lost. I am here as Messiah. And what I ask of you is to have faith in me the same way the Israelites had faith in God that he would be able to heal them from their snake bites in the wilderness through the lifting up of that serpent. I want you to have faith in me that it is through my merits the Spirit of God works in our hearts that one can enter the kingdom of God through me. This is a huge charge that Jesus is asking of Nicodemus. You see, Nicodemus, remember, came into this meeting thinking maybe at the most Jesus was a prophet. At the most, you know, okay, he's causing uproar, I want to talk with him. But Jesus dropping this on him is, I am more than just a prophet. I am the Messiah. I am the one that you all have been waiting for. We don't have a response from Nicodemus about what Jesus said to him. And it carries on in verse 18 through 21. 
But I like how the writer Ellen White mentions about Nicodemus and what she says in Desire of Ages. She says that um, Nicodemus related the story to John in an interview and by his hand it was recorded for the instructions of millions. And to paraphrase, again, he saw that fulfillment when Christ was crucified and that when it came time for the early church to really get started, Nicodemus was one of the people that was willing to put up a financial and political support to help this new movement take off the ground that would eventually turn the world upside down. Nicodemus didn't immediately accept Jesus' teaching right away. He was struggling through it. But over the course of those years that Jesus was ministering, that Nicodemus heard and saw what Jesus was doing, his heart was changed, and he finally understood what the ultimate sacrifice that Christ made truly meant. You see, the guys that are going to be on the field on Sunday for the Super Bowl are putting their bodies out there, their time, everything that they build up to sacrifice for the goal of a championship of the Super Bowl, of getting a ring and getting their name recorded as a champion in the halls of the NFL records. Well, Christ, during his media day interview with Nicodemus, was pointing to the ultimate victory, the victory over death, the victory over sin, the victory to reclaim the earth as his. Christ's sacrifice is even more than we can possibly imagine. We can see men put their bodies on the line for their team. Christ put his body on the line for all of us. Even for people that don't care. That's how much God loves each and every one of you. That even if you don't care that Jesus died for you, he did it anyway. That's how much he loves us. I don't know how many of us would be willing to put down our lives for someone that didn't really care whether or not we did or not. And if you're wondering why Jesus would even do that, later on, near the end of his ministry, in fact, during the Last Supper, the famous Last Supper, there's a beautiful, beautiful speech that he's giving to his disciples. And in chapter 15, it says, uh, verse 13, Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all things that I heard from my Father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, and that your fruit should remain, that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. These things I command you, that you love one another. Why did Christ lay down his life for us? Because he views us as his friends. Even if you don't want Jesus as your friend, he's there available to be your friend. Mm -hmm. And his sacrifice on the cross for us is evidence of that. Because he laid down his lives for his friends, for all of humanity. The famous missionary... David Livingston, and if you're not familiar with David Livingston, he was a missionary to Africa, and he actually was there about 15 years. 15 years as a missionary in Africa. Do you know how many people he converted while he was there? In 15 years, one. One person was converted while he was there. And they asked him later on about this sacrifice that he had made because he was from the United Kingdom. And he said, uh, people talk of the sacrifice I have made 
in spending so much of my life in Africa, can that be called a sacrifice which is simply acknowledging a great debt we owe to our God, which we can never repay? Is that a sacrifice which brings its own reward and healthy activity, the consciousness of doing good, peace of mind, and a bright hope of a glorious destiny? It is emphatically no sacrifice, rather it is a privilege. Anxiety, sickness, suffering, danger, foregoing the common conveniences of this life, these may make us pause and cause the spirit to waver and the soul to sink. But let this only be for a moment. All these are nothing compared with the glory which I shall later which shall later be revealed in and through us. I never made a sacrifice. Of this we ought not to talk when we remember the great sacrifice which he made, who left his father's throne on high to give himself for us. Jesus Christ made the ultimate sacrifice. Today, if you want to accept his sacrifice in your life, maybe you have before and you want to renew that, or maybe you never have before, I would invite you to raise your hand. And if you have questions about it after this sermon about what it truly means, please come see me. I'll be out in the main area. But let us remember that while this Sunday, those men are laying down their lives for their team, Christ has laid down his life for each and every one of you. And you may claim his victory as your own. Let us pray. God in heaven, thank you for your victory, for your ultimate sacrifice. That it is through you that the Holy Spirit works in our hearts and makes us born again. And Lord, we thank you that it is through faith that this happens, that it's not through our own good works, but rather, Lord, we bear good works because of your working in our lives. We ask, Lord, that you would please help us to remember this sacrifice and to be bearers of good fruit and friends of you to each and every person we encounter. In Jesus' name, amen. Our closing hymn is going to be number 